Hello there, you're watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive in the next half hour. We'll see what's making the headlines with journalist and author Christina Patterson and the barrister and broadcaster Andrew Eborn. So let's see what is on some of those front pages. Well, the Mail on Sunday reports that the PM has warned that Britain faces being overwhelmed by illegal migration, which will, quote, destroy our democracy. Meanwhile, the Sunday Telegraph reports that hostile states are using migration to destabilize the West. The Foreign Secretary David Cameron has joined his German counterpart in calling for a sustainable Gaza ceasefire. That's the front of the Sunday Times. The Sunday Mirror splashes on Alex Batty's return to the UK following his ordeal in France. The Sunday People also leading with the British teenager's return after being missing for six years. Two rugby players whose £9 million motor neuron disease campaign moved the British public are to be honoured in the King's New Year's honours list. That's on the front of the Sunday Express. And the Daily Star on Sunday says, one in three of us will flee our relatives over Christmas for some me time in the garden. But what happens if you don't have a garden? <laughs> anyway, a reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the program, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's papers while you watch us. And as I mentioned, we are joined tonight by Christina Patterson and Andrew Eborn. Great to have you uh, with us here. Okay, so let's start front page of the Sunday Times relating, uh, of course, to the ongoing war between Israel and Hamas. And uh, David Cameron, Lord Cameron, saying it's time for a sustainable Gaza ceasefire. And he sort of made this comment with his German counterpart. Uh, uh, Christina, tell us more about the story and also what you make of it. Well, this has obviously been very carefully orchestrated. There is clearly enormous alarm, um, particularly in the US and, I mean, frankly, in pretty much every country in the world. But um, the US and the UK were the only countries to veto in the latest UN call for a ceasefire. And it's obviously an incredibly complicated and difficult situation, but I don't think anyone can look at what's happening in Gaza and think this is a war that's being well conducted in a targeted way. I mean, for a start, three of the hostages have just been killed by uh, Israeli forces. And my heart obviously goes out to the relatives of the hostages, but also to the Israeli forces. Can you imagine living with that? Uh, I mean, for, you know, to be essentially massacring innocent civilians every day and then murdering your own hostages. How could you live with that? I think it's become clear that Netanyahu is not taking instructions for anyone, including the US, and his strategy seems to be for him to stay in power as long as possible, because that way he will avoid the corruption charges that are facing him. And it also seems to be uh, that to target Hamas and it coincidentally wipe out pretty much the whole uh, of Gazan infrastructure and, and civilian population. So the whole thing is an absolute catastrophe and what David Cameron and his German counterpart are doing are essentially saying, look, we've got to start looking at what happens later. It can't go on like this. We have to find a political solution. Because, Andrew, there have been two developments, um, uh, really. Uh, one was the interview with the Israeli ambassador to the UK saying there's something that other members of the Israeli yes. government had said before, uh, that there really isn't a two-state solution that they're uh, thinking about. And then Benjamin Netanyahu gave a news conference earlier today talking about how the country is heartbroken over the killing of the hostages, but I think the exact phrase he used was, you know, this is an ongoing and it will be a, a long war. So it seems to be the opposite that the many Western nations, as Christina was saying, are sort of asking for. Oh, absolutely. And there's some really serious questions to be asked about Netanyahu when people are sort of turning around and saying, look, this is what we have to do. And the statement is very, very clear. They say the sooner this happens, the cease ceasefire, uh, the better. It is now a matter of absolute urgency. Uh, but certainly those questions will not go away. And I think uh, Netanyahu and uh, uh, that whole sort of situation will be explored in much greater detail and everything will come out, I'm sure.
Yeah. Let's go to the Sunday Telegraph now, front page uh, there. Let's see if we can have a look at it. Prime Minister, hostile states using migration to destabilize the West. Obviously, we can see a very loved up picture there of Rishi Sunak and Georgia Maloney, who apparently are actually great friends. Oh, good. <laughs> um, yes. Well, there you go. <laughs> Just as well. They have migration uh, in common. They have, a, uh, you know, a common challenge. And he was speaking at this far right meeting uh, in Rome and very much pushing, I guess, the, the common theme that they have of migration. What did you make of of what he said and where he's saying it as well. Well, I, I think it is interesting because he's ramping up the language. I mean, we, we always remember the five-point plan for Rishi and it's always about stopping the boats and so on and so forth. But this is the, the, a very strong affirmation, again, that we basically need to work together with this uh, to try, try and sort this out. Um, but the asylum convention needs that to be re, a revamp, is what he's saying, to, to stop the countries being overwhelmed. And this is a, a sort of common theme. The figures are alarming. And when you look at what was sort of promised at the beginning and the bring migration down and so on and so forth. Uh, they're a way off that at the moment. And obviously an election is looming, it's no surprise to anybody, um, certainly next year. It's either going to be in March or the autumn, is, is, is what I heard, and I'm sure you're hearing similar sort of things. Um, but they need to get some sort of movement on this. So I think this is a ramping up of that language uh, as sort of affirmation of that particular policy. And, and Christina, let's just take a look at the mail on Sunday, because it's the same story but a different front page. Uh, and again, Rishi Sunak, so mail on Sunday, front page, Rishi, illegal migrants will overwhelm uh, UK. And he made the issue about not just the UK, but Europe. And, you know, language is crucial in a story yeah. like migration. And we shouldn't forget he is you know, at a conference with a leader that not that long ago, because yeah. of her, you know, roots in neo-fascism, et cetera, um, has used this sort of language. Yeah. So there's the issue of migration and then there's the language around it that can be incendiary. I think it's shocking and... Uh... He also describes Georgia Maloney as centre-right. There is no way on God's earth that she is centre-right. She has been slightly less far-right than one might have guessed from her uh, campaigning manifesto, but she is definitely not centre-right. As you say, her roots are in neo-fascism. And this is very, very dangerous language, particularly in the light of the fact that an asylum seeker killed himself on the Bibi Stockholm in the last couple of days, a doctor who was seeking safety in this country. I think it's a distraction for Rishi Sunak from the key issue, which is that since the Tories have had control of our borders post-Brexit, last year we had 740,000 net migrants. Uh, that's legal migration. So he's focusing on, I think we've had about 25,000 people who've come over on the boats. And of course, that is a serious situation. But let's sort out the 740,000, because if that's perceived as an issue, which apparently it is because they're making immigration pretty much the, the biggest issue. I don't think it is the biggest issue that British people are worrying about at the moment. I'm not saying it isn't an issue. And of course, as climate change has more of an impact, there will be many hundreds of thousands, if not millions, who will want to seek safety in the West and who can blame them. But to present this as the biggest issue facing our country at the moment is just ridiculous. OK, we've got two more minutes. Let's go to the uh, Sunday Telegraph, another story from there, about Keir Starmer. Starmer acted for extremist group in a bid to overturn... Uh, ban. Andrew, talk us through this. Well, it is interesting because basically as a lawyer, uh, you take on cases. It doesn't necessarily use, mean you support the cases that you take, but this has got a particular spin on this. They're saying that somebody who aspires to be Prime Minister uh, to, taking a case to defend uh, in this particularly, uh, they say it's frankly beyond the pale. I think that's missing the point about what lawyers do. Where they're paid mouth... I'm a lawyer. We're paid mouthpieces. You work on that sort of basis mm -hmm. and everybody's entitled to a fair trial. So I think whilst I appreciate it's on the front page, and you turn around and say it's an appalling case. Nevertheless, as a lawyer, he, he took it. Do you agree? I do agree. I think that uh, I think that is a lawyer's job. I mean, we have a system of representation that yes. when you go to court, you have a legal right to be represented. Imagine if everyone turned down particular people because they didn't like the sound of their their beliefs or their crimes or their politics. It's just crazy. And as the as the piece goes on to say, a Labour source said to suggest the person who prosecuted the airline liquid bomb plotters is anything other than tough on terrorism is ridiculous. And he's right, or she's right. So yes, it's completely mad. It's like saying a doctor treated someone who didn't share their political views. It's completely mad. Because the group in question is Isbut Tahrir, isn't it? Yes. 
Welcome back. You're watching the press preview with me uh, now, uh, Christina Patterson and Andrew Eborn. Thank you both uh, for staying with us. Okay, let's go straight to the Telegraph. Um, and there, Lib Dems call for scrutiny of the worrying Telegraph takeover. And that is, um, yes, because it's a uh, from the Gulf, basically, that could be. Christina, yeah. tell us what the story um, is. Well, it's interesting that this is on the front page of the Telegraph, because I suspect what it really means is Telegraph calls for scrutiny of worrying, <laughs> worrying acquisition of Telegraph, because all kinds of people have suggested their, uh, voiced their anxiety, including Lucy Fraser, the culture secretary, but mm. including also a number of Telegraph journalists like Camilla Tomine, associate yeah. um, uh, editor of The Telegraph, who is very worried about the implications for women. Essentially, the vice president of the UAE um, is uh, backing the fund that is set yes. to take Red over Bird the Telegraph. Yes. And, um, and, of course, the press freedom in the UAE is not the same as press freedom here. And the anxiety, the very well-founded anxiety, which has been voiced in this particular case by Jamie Stone, the Lib Dem spokesman on culture and media affairs, is that to have a British national paper owned by the UAE, essentially by the UAE, who essentially dictate policy in their papers would be a very worrying state of affairs, and I agree. I think and it would, it would be, be Telegraph and The Spectator. Yes, yes. exactly. And I think those, they rather prejudge it by saying it's worrying. I think everything, every takeover from a media point of view, needs to be scrutinised. You go through the usual sort of processes. Uh, but to prejudge it by saying it's worrying, uh, I, I think, is overstepping it. I think you're right to look at things and, and to question that in the appropriate way. OK. Um, let's look at this story still in the Sunday Telegraph. Pope's former advisor jailed in Vatican fraud trial of the century. Andrew. It is quite extraordinary since it's the stuff of movies where mm. uh, this tap who was at one stage touted to be Pope, uh, I think they were sort yeah. of looking at this thing. But basically he's now been sentenced to five and a half years in jail uh, for embezzlement over the purchase of the former Harrods car showroom. Um, so it, it's it, quite an extraordinary story. Um, but it shows that nobody's above the law, even if you're um, protected in, in the appropriate way. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's, that's the sort of... Uh, it is, in fact, uh, the fraud trial of the century, namely because of who's involved and, <laughs> and, and that sort of side. Yeah, Cardin Christina? Utterly surreal, utterly surreal. It reminds me of, uh, I think, Anthony Burgess used to write novels about what ha happened at the Vatican. And yes. you, you literally couldn't make it up. But the idea that these people are regarded as sort of spokespeople for God, well, certainly the Pope is, um, <laughs> it's just breathtaking, really. All right, let's go to the Sunday Times now. Uh, front page again. About the Royal Mail, undercover footage shows Royal Mail is leaving letters on the shelf. I've just mm. mailed all my Christmas cards, so I'm particularly yeah. outraged by this. Well, um, <laughs> why are they leaving the, the I, well, letters they, on the they shelf? They haven't got time to do it. But what you should do is follow the advice in the cartoon now, which is yeah. actually, if you, if you see the cartoon, what they've done, they've they posted uh, their Christmas cards in a big package. Yeah. So you can then turn yeah. and you'll get them delivered in That's that particular That's a lot of wrapping, though. It's, <laughs> a lot, it's a lot of wrapping. But what a delightful surprise when it arrives and how disappointing <laughs> when you open it up. <laughs> it, is, it is disappointing, though. I mean, because joking aside, a lot of people will send Christmas cards and a lot of people still do it. It's sort of fallen uh, out I of fashion. It's, but I think it's it shocking. I regard it as a kind of a fundamental duty to spend hours and hours every Christmas working my way through my Christmas card list, handwriting in my illegible handwriting little <laughs> messages to everybody. And then you go to the post office, you buy your stamps, £1.25 each mm. for a first-class stamp. Then I went to my local post box, which had... I think until last week said final delivery 5 p.m. Suddenly it's saying last delivery 9 a.m. And you're thinking, hang on, you're putting the price up. You're having kind of deliveries about once every six years and you're not even delivering them when they are picked up from the post box. So I think we're all being swindled, essentially. I think I understand that the Royal Mail is under intense competition from couriers and obviously most of all digital digital communications, but I, I do think they really need to up their game. They're providing a shocking service. Do you both send, send Christmas cards? It, it is yeah. interesting, because a lot of people now are turning around and saying, well, rather than the £200 I spend, most of which is on postage rather than the card <laughs> yeah. itself, they're going to make a donation to charity. Yeah, but no, and, but... and I think it, there's something special about receiving a card and a letter in the post written by hand, about, even if it's illegible. Yeah, exactly. It's about the effort, isn't it? It's about yeah. sitting down and making an effort. Even if you haven't seen people for years, it shows that you're still thinking of them, that they 
have a little role in your head and heart. And I think, I think it's one of those social niceties that's worth doing, but I resent the Royal Mail's part in it. <laughs> All right, let's finish with a picture of Elon Musk, uh, front page of the Sunday Times. There he is with one of his 11 children, again, at that um, <sighs> meeting in Rome where they were all talking about birth rates and plummeting birth rates, certainly in Italy, but really across uh, uh, Europe. Why did you pick, uh, pick this uh, story? Well, apart from the glorious picture, and it's slightly different about all, all the rest of the news, I mean, he's saying, procreate like me. Well, having 11 children is pretty expensive, unless you've got several billion in the bank and, uh, and, uh, and nannies and so on and so forth to, mm. to look after them. It is interesting. But a lot of these 11 children have wonderful names. He has uh, some with the artist Grimes, one of which uh, I think his son is called X, and he says, that uh, his company was named after it because uh, it worked on that sort of uh, premise as well, which is why he renamed Twitter, uh, one of the explanations, is to, uh, after his after son. After his son. Christina, what do you make of that procreate like me line? Oh, he's nuts, isn't he? He's basically nuts. Uh, obviously extremely rich, bit of a mad genius thing going on, bit of a fascist thing going on as well, it seems, bit of an anti-Semitic thing going on. So I don't think I would particularly relish being Elon Musk's child.